Okay, hi everybody. I got a special re request from James Corbett to do an analysis of a forbidden Beatles video. And why I say forbidden is if I call this video by the title of the song on my YouTube channel, it'll get deleted or muted by some big corporation that hates the idea of people, you know, learning shit. So, anyways. <clears throat> Uh, we're going to talk about the song, If I Fell, and the real, actual, deep stuff is in the first uh, 30 seconds or so of the song where he does um, a half-step modulation in the introduction. Now, this song is unique in a few senses. First of all, the Beatles were drawing on a very old style of writing that dates back to the 40s uh, and 30s, where you'd have a pop song but you'd have this kind of sweet little intro that has nothing to do with the rest of the song. Uh, another Beatles song that does that would be um, Honey Pie. She was a working girl, north of England way. Then she's at the big time in the USA. And if I could only see her now. This is what I'd say. Ba -da -ba. And then it goes into the song. Uh, if I Fell has a similar device. And in fact, you have to understand that the Beatles were very much influenced by uh, music from the 40s. I mean, they weren't so far from that generation. Um, uh, so here is what the song sounds like from the intro, and hopefully this will record well. If I fell in love with you, would you promise to be true and help me understand? Cause I've been in love before and now the song begins. This is really a very lovely song, and the recording you're here, what they will allow on YouTube is live uh, videos of the Beatles. Luckily, this was captured live, and if this is the um, the uh, live capture I'm thinking of, it's it's really, I've been in bands where you have to sing three-part harmony, and it is a bitch. It's really hard to do, to get those voices so coordinated that you're, uh, you know, you're, you're hearing something that really does sound very melodious and beautiful. The Beatles did an awesome job of this. They were truly wonderful. But the song itself is not so spectacular or remarkable uh, if you take the introduction away. Now, the introduction incorporates a device called the half-step modulation. In many, many, many songs, uh, this half-step modulation creates almost melodrama. And sometimes if it's used wrongly, um, it, it can sound corny. Um, you know, I was doing a search on the internet for half-step modulation examples, and I finally found one, uh, which I'm going to clip to this uh, recording uh, later on as I edit it. Um, but just to dramatize the sound, uh, if I'm in the key of D, and I'm, let's say I have some random chord progression of the key of D. Right, if I want to create a half step modulation to the next key higher, the next one up, which would be E flat, I use, and you'll see this as we go along, I use a connecting dominant seventh chord. And you can see how that's, uh, that's a little over the top. It's even worse when you don't use a connecting chord. For example, uh, that the Beatles were masterful at is the art of modulation. You notice how, how that modulation just slammed you in the face, like, here I am, a new key. Well, the very best composers in the world, and that includes Bach and the Beatles. Now, let me, maybe I'm overemphasizing the greatness of the Beatles, but let me just say here, I have a buddy that went to music school, and um, his harmony teacher said, if you want to understand modulation, study Bach and the Beatles. And anybody that's worth their salt, anybody that's worth their salt in a musician will, as a musician will recognize the brilliance of their chord movements and how they all worked. Okay, so, uh, 
Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to stand by that. The Beatles were magnificent at modulating. Um, now, there's a half-step modulation in this intro, and notice how it doesn't smash you over the head. If I play the chords for it... Um, tune but you get the idea um, it's it's not smashing you in the face in fact it's very lovely the way the chords are moving so the question is how is all of this accomplished but before I do that I'm gonna I want to make this space right here available for a song from uh, the late 60s early 70s that had one of these uh, big ass modulations and how cornified uh, the song becomes at that point when they use it. So, take it away. Those precious and few are the moments we took and shared. Precious and few are the moments we took and shared. All right. Now let's come back to, to the world of music theory and see what's going on here. Uh, first of all, I want to show you this. What we have here are the keys of D flat and the key of D. So that's the half step. We're starting in uh, D flat and moving to D. Now here's the chord progression at the bottom. These rows are the chords that belong to each of these two separate keys. D flat, E flat minor, F minor, G flat, A flat, major or seventh, and that's an important one, and finally B flat minor. Here we have D, E minor, F sharp minor, G, A or possibly A7, and B minor. Now what the Beatles moved from was what's called the two chord of the key of D flat, right? And then that would be E flat minor. Then it moves to the D chord, all right? Now what's that D doing there? Well, it is replacing what would normally be the A flat 7. This is a chord movement called the tritone substitution. And this, they say it only happens with dominant seventh chords, but it also can be done with major chords. I've seen the Beatles do this over and over again. Works exactly the, way, the same way without that extra little spice of the, uh, what's called the tritone inside of the chord. So we could say, there's a movement in music called two, five, one. The second chord of the key, the fifth chord of the key, and the first chord of the key. What these two do is they lead you down the road to this chord, which would be home, okay? All right, so we're going from E flat, and instead of going to A flat, we're doing the tritone substitution of D. And that's perfectly legal and valid. And what D does is it resolves, just the way A flat 7 would resolve to D flat, D resolves to D flat in the same way. Okay? I don't know if you're seeing this or not. So we have the movement E minor, the tritone substitution for what would have been the 5 7 chord to take us home to D flat, but this D takes us to D flat in any case, all right? So we have the 2, the substitute for 5, and the 1. Then we have what's called the sixth chord of the key of D-flat. That's all well and good. That's normal to the key. So really, you notice there's only one chord that's out of the key, right? That would be D. Now, what makes this move so brilliant is the second iteration. We think we're going to hear the same thing because we're going E-flat to D, but now he treats D as the root chord of D major and does the 2-5 of D major, which is here's two, E minor, and here's five. And once again, the two five or the two five one is um, commonly taught in jazz schools in a, as an appurtenance to move you to a key or to state a key. If, if the two five never went to D, the key of D is still pretty much stated here. Okay, so that's really what's going on with the intro. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, it's, it's seamless. And this is very, I think this is off their first record, if I'm not mistaken. This is very, very early when they were still quite young. Okay, so that's, the, that's really the meat and potatoes of the song. But 
since you asked for the entirety of the song, I'm going to um, talk about uh, the rest of the body of the song. The song continues in the key it established at D, and it mostly uses chords from the key. If I gave my heart to you, I must be sure. So we have D, E minor, F sharp minor, A7. Let me play that. subtle things. There's a sus4 in the A7. I won't go into that detail. It's, it's too much. But I will say this. We're traveling up the chord family of D in sequence. One to two to three. If I kept going, it would sound like the Do Re Mi scale. Do, Do Re Mi Fa Sol Ti Do. Okay. So, um, and Bob Dylan, by the way, used the same appurtenance of just traveling up the chords in his song like a Rolling Stone. One, once upon a time, you dressed so fine, didn't have a dime in your pride. Did you know what you mean so? Right? So uh, this, is, uh, this has been used before. Now the Beatles add a little bit of a loungy thing to this. When they go, and they go back down to E minor, pardon me a second, I got a tune. Um, so what they do, we have the two chord here and the three chord here, and you notice they're, they're both the same shape, that's because they're both minor chords. And this is commonly done in lounge music. When you go to the three to the two, you fill in the middle with this one. So now we're going in chromatic sequence, adjacent steps. So if I give my heart to you, very loungy sounding. I must be sure from the very start that you would love me more. So now what's this? This chord is out of the key. This too is a tritone, what's called a tritone substitution chord, and what it's substituting for is an E7. I'm not going to go into this, uh, but it's, it's substituting for a very much more conventional chord, which if it was there would sound like this. Uh, Notice how much more spicy the other chord is. Much more tension in that chord. I'm going to talk in the future in great detail about tritone substitutions on fragments of infinity. I don't want to get too deep with this right now. All right, so we have that. Now what we have is the bridge. Wow, this is a beautiful song. Um, all right, so what's going there now? Uh, we hear. Uh, let me see what the melody is. So they're hitting this E note, but what they're playing against the E note is a D7, which with that E note combined to the D7 gives us a D9. Now D7 and D9 are essentially the same chord. They function exactly the same way. They're meant to take us to G, which exactly is what's going on there. Here's the key of uh, G right here. Here's the key of D. Now. Um, the chord that came up was D9. The chord that came up is D9. This is D7, same chord as D9. Let's just say D9 is a, fan, a let's say D9 is D7 in a tuxedo, okay? So, so we're traveling along in the key of D, when suddenly instead of resolving on a D chord, they resolve on a D7 chord. Well, remember the five chords important? It takes us to a one. And for that moment, that one is the key of G. D7 is now taking us to G, which then turns into G minor. Uh, now that, the G minor is something called the four minor chord, and it's so important that it was brought up in, as a string of chords in, uh, in uh, composition class. Uh, the four chord of the key of D 
one, two, three, four is G major, okay? G major to G minor to D is very, very common, okay? You see this kind of movement in songs like Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. Um, but let's, let's look at this one. So if I play the D chord, then I turn it to that 5-7 chord that belonged to the key of G, and then it takes us nicely to G, and then here's our minor chord, G minor. Now why the G minor? This is creating something called a line. I have this note from D7, this note from G major, and this note from G minor, and then I go back to D. So I get this chromatic line, and that part, this part of the chromatic line is the G minor chord. It, it brings in that one note that relaxes us back to D. And that is pretty much uh, the entire song, um, I just marvel, I marvel at that half-step modulation as you've seen in the examples and heard. It, it can slap you in the face and this is so beautifully elegant and done so well. Thanks so much for watching and uh, I'll see you uh, in the future. Bye.